Eastern Himalayan Economics Forum 2020. This is our first virtual forum, uh, but the eighth edition of the, of the forum going on for the last many years in the Eastern Himalayas. This also happens to be, and I think thanks to the fact that it's virtual, it has happens to be the first very international mindful tourism panel that we are hosting. Uh, the focus this year of the Eastern Himalayan Nationomics Forum, uh, keeping in mind uh, the many events that the world has gone through in the last uh, few months, is really to talk about how we need to bring ecology to the center stage of the economy and sustainable enterprises form a critical part of how this transition can be made and how a post-COVID future-proof future can be created. Uh, we have today with us a great panel, and I'm gonna start by giving very, very brief introductions. We have Anna B. Matsutera, who's the director of the International Gorilla Conservation Program based in Rwanda. We have Jamie D. Jamie D. Chavez, who's the sustainability and pollution control officer at the El Nido Resort in the Philippines. We have Joanna Van Grusen, uh, Joanna is part of a sustainable tourism initiative called the Sarai Atoria in Central India. We have Husna Tara Prakash, who's co-founder and managing director of the Glenburn Tea Estate and Boutique Hotels in the northeastern part of India. And today, moderating the show will be Shobha Mohan, who's the founder partner of Rare India. Over the next hour, we'll, we, we really want to highlight some of the best case studies for mindful tourism across the world and use this panel as a learning for the rest of the Eastern Himalayas as, as a way forward for the tourism industry in a part of the world which contains a lot of its biological diversity, a lot of cultural diversity, and how can we use tourism as a means for conservation, not just of biodiversity, but of actually being able to enhance cultures as well. I'm going to now pass on to Shobha to take this session forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Saurav. That was very, very crisp and very well put. Uh, today we have, uh, the, the way the, the panel is uh, looking is that we have two people who are, have concentrated all their efforts in building and uh, creating a positive impact for the community. And we have uh, two uh, others who actually work with uh, nature and environment and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, in, in their areas of operation. So uh, it would be uh, interesting to see what each one of them do. So without much... Uh, Without miss, wasting much time, I uh, will uh, will kind of have them e each one of them talk to us about uh, what they do uh, in their uh, uh, in their tourism products as a part of their tourism product and why they do it, which I think is a very very important part of uh, every conservation story. So should we uh, begin with uh, Joanna? Do you want to go first? It's very nice to be here today. It's an honor and a pleasure and. Uh... I may be the oldest person on the panel, but I may be the youngest in tourism because I joined it only 10 years ago. My background was actually in wildlife filmmaking and photography. And I'm married to a, a Raghu, a biologist who had studied the tigers in Panna Tiger Reserve, Central India. And when that was completed, we wanted to come back and do conservation, but we needed some kind of economic base. So that was when we decided to look at tourism. Near the Tiger Reserve um, are some amazing temples and I'm gonna start sharing my screen because I can't talk about them without just showing you one of them at least. And um, so these are the Kajrao temples. They're a thousand years old and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Cent uh, site and completely fantastic. But we found that Tourists would come in for one night, they'd fly into Kajra, they'd stay in a hotel which could be anywhere in India or anywhere in the world even, and they'd fly out. So all they did was see, they didn't get beyond that and the um, benefit of them coming didn't go beyond that. So we thought we could uh, do, uh, we could find a niche there for ourselves. So a little outside the town, about half an hour away, 20 minutes, we found uh, an area where we um, built an eight uh, room, lodge which we call the Sarayatoria. We also have a, had set up a small NGO uh, trust called Bowen 
Bowen in Hindi means 52 and was named after one of the study tigers, which I put a little picture in the corner. I don't know if you can see, but she has like a five and a two written above her eyes. So that's where the name came from. So we sit in about 11 acres of land. We have eight rooms and the rest we've allowed to go wild. It used to be overgrazed farmland. And we looked at the local architecture to, um, I mean, our main name was to have a low footfall. So we looked to local designs and mud was the most sensible for the climate. So we built in mud and um, basically our idea was to keep it simple, but to have all the necessities, all the things we wanted to see in a hotel room without anything extra. But um, the main thing was to bring tourists to stay longer in the area and to experience a little more and in a little more depth. And we're right by the Cane River, which is a beautiful place for boating and Zen-like, it's been said. So it's very good for um, bringing in mindfulness as our, our yoga class is by the river. The um, key point of the stay really is all the staff who are from the local area and bring in the um, interaction and help people to understand more clearly the kind of um, culture that they're staying in. However, one of the things we um, immediately found was that tourism, wildlife tourism, because we were always also wildlife tourism, being next to a wildlife reserve and wildlife people ourselves, has a very bad name in India. And people tend to think that it's exploitative and it's just a few people making lots of money out of um, the wildlife that is held, you know, looked after by the government. So, the, but there's no, there was very little information to say that. So the, one of the first things we did as an NGO was collaborate with Toff Tigers and do a tourism study in Madhya Pradesh amongst four tiger reserves. And even we were surprised at how much this kind of unplanned tourism actually fed back into the community. And overall, it generated 166 crore rupees, which is around nearly $26 million, 45% of which went into the local economy, um, which meant $11.7 uh, million a year, which is really pretty substantial. And it also created a you know, large number of jobs because there was 85 percent, uh, 80 percent local employment. And on top of that, 85 percent of it was actually budget travel. So, you know, there weren't a lot of people making a lot of money, but there was a lot of money going into the local community. So we realized that that, you know, might be a good way to, um, I mean, that tourism could be a good catalyst for further conservation. In India, all the conservation is done by the government. It's all in the hands of the government and it's um, protected in areas which are what they call inviolate, which means people are not um, allowed to live in it. So it's a very exclusive conservation. And since that's the only, um, they're the only ones who do, it means that we don't really have very much conservation tourism here. And that was something we wanted to explore. So to do that, um, we, um, looked, found an area which was beyond the protected area and beyond the buffer area of the protected area, but still had some wonderful forest, which belonged to the government, but, um, you know, was not being used for conservation protection. So basically wanting to take the tourism, I mean, the conservation beyond protected areas and also wanting to use an inclusive model, we have started to get to know the community in those areas and work with them initially um, through sort of entry level activities like um, nature education, we're working a lot with the schools and also with health camps, you know, eye camps. And now the bottom right picture is showing our um, support teacher who is the only one who's carrying on education in the region because the schools are all closed due to the COVID problem. So the idea is that, you know, we would eventually like to see tourism being you know, more active and spreading conservation and development. And we think there are ways that, you know, everyone can benefit. The tourists can benefit by having a much more inclusive and deep experience. And the local community, you know, can benefit and the and wildlife also, you know, if tourism is um, handled mindfully and used as a driving force for conservation as well as development. 
So we're still in fairly initial stages, but we hope to take it forward and um, look forward to sharing our ups and downs as we go along. Yeah, great. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, my name is Anna Ben Massozera, and I'm the director of the International Guerrilla Conservation Program, and I'm joining from Kigali in Rwanda. And so I'm very happy to share with you uh, from another part of the world um, and another, another species and story entirely. Um, the International Guerrilla Conservation Program is, is a, a special program. It's a coalition program and it's been around for approximately 40 years. And our story is really about cooperation, collaboration, facilitating dialogue, and agreement around of mountain gorillas. And we're a little bit different from the other panelists um, in that we don't actually manage any tourism product. We don't manage any park. Um, we don't own any property. So we are exclusively a conservation organization grounded in conservation science. And again, facilitating dialogue and agreement um, as a core tenet of what we do. Um, and just to note that the mountain gorillas are very small, um, two population. Um, in Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So how does mindful tourism factor into to the mountain gorilla story? And it actually factors in quite um, prominently. So um, you might be aware that of all the great ape species globally that are not us humans, it's actually the mountain gorilla as a subspecies that has stable or growing populations um, over the last 30 years. And a big part of that is, is because of the interest that the global community has, um, a, as well as the cultural and economic significance of, of these species at a, at a local level. So actually, Mountain gorilla tourism was introduced and it was, it was put in place very quickly. Um, that actually stopped the conversion of forest um, from mountain gorilla habitat to uh, land for human use, whether it's agriculture or livestock. And, and since then, over the last uh, 30 years, it's really grown to, to be you know, quite a, a, a pretty special, experience, a wildlife encounter experience. Um, uh, and it's, it's quite profound to be able to be so close to such a charismatic species um, and being allowed into their habitat. So in and of itself, that's quite a, a spiritual experience for, for most people, um, similar to what Joanna was saying about uh, the temple. Um, and so the success of of tourism features prominently in the success of the continued existence of mountain gorillas. And what I'll also let you know is that it's not unique to, to mountain gorillas. So, so this map shows you all the different sites um, that pre-COVID-19 actually offered some type of great ape um, tourism experience on the continent. So, Mountain gorilla is only one of four subspecies of gorilla on the continent. Um, and so mountain gorilla, grower gorilla, western lowland gorilla, the different subspecies of chimpanzee, um, and even bonobo. So these are you know, over 20 sites where um, some form of wildlife experience with great ape um, is there. Um, and I will say, um, even now in, in November, um, two, two, let's see, three out of the four mountain gorilla sites are actually open for tourism. Um, and it's mostly domestic tourism at this point in time. So like I said, um, mountain gorilla tourism has really been a, a cornerstone to the success story. Um, and it's, its, it's principles are, are grounded in having a sustainable model for the continued conservation of mountain gorillas. And so in terms of contributing to employment, um, what you see here is a group of, of porters waiting at a, at a tourist point to be um, a tourist group to go into the national parks um, to visit mountain gorillas to 
uh, products that are um, sold to, to the tourists from, from the neighboring community. Um, and so the impact is really at local level, but not only that, at, at national and regional level as well, because of the success and, and really the overwhelming global interest to travel to come to um, mountain gorillas is actually, it contributes to, um, you know, the, the top or within the top three uh, foreign income earning at a national level for Rwanda and Uganda. Um, and all of that feeds into to development locally, development nationally, and also back into protection and, and conservation work. Um, so what we've, we've come to appreciate, and um, we were starting to appreciate this even before COVID-19, is that this is a very fragile model um, and made even more prominent um, under COVID-19. And so it really challenges us to think about what are the core tenets of why mountain gorilla tourism? Who's involved? Who is it benefiting? And, and how do we sustain this over the long term? And so again, we don't manage any products. We don't take any decisions regarding how tourism around mountain gorillas is, is, is taken. So what we've done is that we've partnered with Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network uh, to develop a series of standards and voluntary certification schemes um, around certified gorilla friendly. Um, so we have the, the standards for parks, tour operators, hotels and lodges, and in fact, even guides. We also have the, the certified gorilla friendly park edge community products. So how does a tourist distinguish what has flown in from another part uh, of the country or the region from what is you know, genuinely made by, by people who, who share the landscape with mountain gorillas. And then also the Gorilla Friendly Pledge, which is a way that um, anyone who is visiting mountain gorillas or cares about mountain gorillas can log into gorillafriendly.org and, and kind of take a pledge to those core tenants um, around um, the protection of mountain gorillas around, you know, the, the transparency and good governance of, of how people are involved in mountain gorilla conservation. Um, and so we, we, because we facilitate dialogue and agreement rather than um, take decision making, um, we've gone this route of, of creating a set of standards that, um, again, in a voluntary um, scenario, people can sign on to. So our dream would, would be to have a number of, of operators um, similar to those that are participating on this panel actually sign into it, um, work more collaboratively together to make sure that the mountain gorilla product is something that would continue to secure the future for mountain gorillas. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anna. That was uh, very insightful and with Joanna talking about tigers and temples in central India and you talking about uh, gorillas. So uh, about the conservation of gorillas. The one thing I wanted to uh, you know, reiterate is that uh, you, you are the government, right? I mean, you work with, with, with your, your policies are set by the government and you work with the government to put out these uh, uh, restrictions or these uh, principles for tourism for uh, gorilla conservation. Uh, so it's a good question. Um, the regulations on all the tourism within the park and even outside of the park is set by, by the government. Um, those are separate from the gorilla friendly standards. So this is a voluntary set of standards um, that either a private entity or the government in terms of their parks would sign on to. Um, and then they go through a process of participatory auditing of, of their operations leading to the certification. So they are in tandem with each other. So yes, policies and regulations around mountain gorilla tourism is set by the government. Um, and we are a partner to them in the conservation of mountain gorillas, but very separate from the gorilla friendly standards themselves. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about how these standards um, get adopted into regulations. Um, for example, tour operators, um, when they're getting their operating license, they, they have to reach a set of standards set by the government. 
Um, and some of what is included in certified gorilla friendly is actually of interest more broadly. And so there is a possibility of uptake with regulations, but two separate process. Two separate processes. And which kind of, um, which is a bit similar to what we have in India, in India that Joanna will talk about. But, um, you know, but it is also uh, in the sense, we, these kind of, um, uh, we, we don't have a very, um, uh, we don't have very active organizations working with the government to set some of the policies. Is that right, uh, Joanna? Well, I don't think we have a very active government policy here, in fact. So the tend to not be regulations unless they've been um, encouraged by an organization like Toff Tigers for yeah. um, places around the parks. But the parks themselves, I think, are at fault in not having more um, rigorous, rigorous advice. standards. Yes. Yeah, standard. And when they do come up with standards, then they bring them out without much discussion with the people who are actually operating on the ground. So they're not you know, they're not necessarily um, appropriate or the ones that would be acceptable, which is another problem. I mean, obviously they can restrict the number of people who go into the natural parks, um, which they do, but, uh, and that's, that's good, but that doesn't stop a lot of um, proliferation of tourism outside, which then causes a mismatch because you may have a lot more um, hotel space, bed space than you do park capacity. And that can lead to some very unfortunate results because people obviously you know, have set up a business and need to find tourism from somewhere to make their ends meet. So, so what you mean is that the regulations or have the, are for people to either create for themselves and follow it because they believe in it, or you, know, you have somebody like Toff Tigers who kind of lays out and does an audit for you, right? Yeah, and also, I mean, like the state government, Madhya Pradesh, for example, within the last year, before COVID at least, had had a meeting about tourism, and the brochures and things that they put out were really quite shocking in the sense that they were giving incentives and encouraging people to set up hotels around places like Bandavga, which is a tiger reserve in central India, that is already completely oversubscribed, you know, so they, they didn't, they don't seem to get the situation at all rather than I mean what we really need because in India people come to see tigers obviously it's a big attraction but there are only four or five places that you know where you have a chance of seeing it so what really needs to happen is to spread that because you obviously don't want to put more and more people in those parks and they're quite right to restrict that but it would be nice and not impossible to have a lot more areas where people could see tigers so, um, you know, rather than just concentrate them all around concentrate the people already yeah. there. Yeah. Which is, yeah, yeah, and carrying capacities are a big issue anyway. Great, thank you so much, Joanna. We, um, are you ready? Uh, Jamie, I, you want to go next? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll start in the second slide now. So first, a, a little background into who we are. Um, our operations is based in Palawan, which has been voted as the best island in the world. So there has been a lot of influx of people in the past couple of years. And well, the company started in 1979 and it started with a partnership with the Japanese, which just have so much love for nature and want to see it thrive. So in 1981, we opened the first island resort in the whole municipality, which is Manilong Island. And this was followed in 1998 by Lagan Island Resort. And then we also went to another municipality, an adjacent municipality in Taitai, and opened up a Putit Island Resort. And then finally, in 2012, we have a Pangulushan Island Resort. So in 2013, we were acquired fully by Ayala Land Inc., which is one of the biggest corporations in the Philippines. And it is very known in being one of the best real estate developers in the country. And so in 2014, we launched Leo Tourism Estate, which is a 325 hectare fully master planned tourism estate. So the turtle is actually everywhere in our operations. So in 1984, the company was instrumental in the declaration of the bay as a turtle sanctuary. And then we also have a program called Bay Green, where green stands for guard, respect, educate, and lido. And as you can see, the logo is of a turtle. And then we also have nameplates worn by staff in the shape of a turtle. And we feature them very 
fondly and a lot in our materials that we use. Of course, seeing them in tours is always a highlight in the guest experience. And we even have a boat that is named a pawikan, a turtle. So that's a tour boat that you can ride on. And finally, during the pandemic, we have now the Be Green and Be, Cle Be Clean program, which is our commitment to enhance care, bearing also the same turtle logo. So there are three main ways in which we promote mindful tourism. First, we ensure that travel can be as guilt-free as possible by looking at ourselves and the ways in which we can tread lightly as a company through sound policies and investments. So investments such as resource efficient equipment, sewage treatment plants, and materials recovery facilities and solid waste management facilities in general are just some of the very important ways we help ensure efficient use of our finite resources. And then we also have policies like local sourcing, plastics ban, and sustainable menus to curb negative impacts in our planet. Next, we also use education to bring awareness not just to our guests, but also to the staff in the communities as well. Part of our Be Green program are trainings on conservation given to staff, suppliers, um, contractors, merchants, and locators, so everyone basically that we work with in the business. And this facilitates grounding and alignment as we work towards the conservation goals. We also find ways to always engage guests the, from the moment they come into the resort all the way to when they get out. And this is done through environmental briefings and presentations. We have eco checklists that we give them so that they'll be encouraged to actually look for animals and try to identify them. And we also have guided tours with nature interpretation. So you can have guides that actually know the place and can identify the different species that you can find in the area. And we also do simple chats and catch ups with our guests to see how their, how their um, trip has been like and what sorts of wildlife they've seen and what interests them and what they want to know more about. And of course, we also take advantage of social media where we talk about our efforts, as well as promote sustainable and responsible tourism. So during this lockdown, we took the advantage of the downtime to create a webinar series on reef conservation. So if you want to check that out, then please follow our pages. Being part of the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network for us doesn't mean that we only focus on the particular animal that we have been certified in. It means making efforts at conservation and conserving entire ecosystems and creating as much partnerships as we can so that we can be successful. So apart from educating, we also actively engage everyone that we work with to have like sim simple efforts like coastal cleanups, tree planting, and also get into the more challenging tasks of uh, creating sustainable, alternative sustainable livelihoods. And then we also try to rally for community support and at the same time push for better laws and policies. So we work a lot with the local government and even the national government, especially at this time that we have the COVID pandemic and we're trying to reopen. So we believe that um, more than being mindful, businesses should also strive to be re regenerative as well. So here's a turtle, one of which we have been releasing for the past couple of years. And we hope to have a lot more turtles and wildlife that will thrive in the area. Thank you. That was great, uh, Jamie. That was really wonderful. Uh, one a question that uh, came to my mind when you were you know, um, talking about this. So you, you talked about uh, creating education for your travelers, right? Uh, yes. And yeah, and also, uh, I mean, your entire uh, program through their stay at the property at your at one of your lodges or one of your resorts is to constantly engage them in uh, in activities that is, that allows them to understand conservation or understand why they are doing you know why they should be looking after the sea turtle and how they can be contributing right so um, do you are you able to um, what's your success rate I mean do you think everybody gets interested and in, do you feel do you find people you know some of the people are not uh, really all there and they want to do something else does that happen there's also a lovely blue sea out there then there could be several other things they might want to do right 
Well, we, I think we can never really like capture everybody, but so far in our experience and also in my personal experience, I think we are at 98% engagement because once you actually talk to the guests and tell them what they can see, what they can experience, um, why they're there and what their role is in everything in the world, they become really interested and they want to learn more. And then when they come home, they want to do more. So in things like turtle releases, although I think this is this has a little bit of bias because turtles are just really cute and it's very easy to capture people with them. So every time we have the turtle release, you know how some people can you will you will notice from the get go that they just want to be there for the photo and then they want to leave right away. But then when we, once you start engaging them and then we talk about the turtles, their importance, the threats. All of a sudden, after the after everything has been done, they start picking up trash and then putting it in the trash bin. So they immediately have um, changes like that. So I think yeah, it's really yeah. about efforts in communicating with everyone as much as possible. Brilliant. And your clientele is mostly um, local travelers. Uh, you might have of... um, so far 50 percent, 50 50, like foreign and domestic domestic wonderful yeah that's really great and we'll come to I, i'll come back to the question of how you uh, how you engage uh, people co totally and you know how do they get they how can they participate after they have gone away right we'll come to that later we'll have husna introduce um, glenburn uh, t estate and uh, penthouse and the work that she's been doing with uh, the community especially in the t estate husna over to you Thank you, Shobha. Thank you, Sora, for inviting me to this wonderful panel. The wonderful thing about going last is that I've had a time to enjoy and absorb all the wonderful things I'm hearing about from mountain gorillas and tiger conservation to the amazing sustainability practices that Jamie's um, using at her hotel. It's, it's, we're all part of this community around the world, I think, that believes in the same ideals and principles. And it's, it's wonderful to share this um, this sort of time together. So I'll just um, share screen and take you through my journey, which was um, something that happened very much by accident. I, I trained to be a science teacher and happened to um, meet my husband when I was backpacking around the world when I was 18. And uh, he happened to be a tea planter. And I sort of moved based from where I grew up in England back to India and ended up marrying into a a fourth generation tea planting family. So that was 23 years ago. And um, I stumbled into hospitality because of the sheer beauty of the tea estates that we, uh, that we owned and we were visiting. And we thought that it would be really interesting to sort of model the tea experience on the vineyards around the world. So it started off as an experiment. Um, and that was almost 20 years ago. And two years ago, we opened our second hotel in Calcutta, the Glenburn Penthouse. And um, in between that, we've also been um, uh, running tours in Calcutta and private excursions. Uh, so our tea estates are in the east of India, and one is in Darjeeling, and the other is in Assam. Um, and it was really Glenburn that just, you know, took our breath away when we first visited, because uh, from the estate, you look up to Mount Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world. And it was really heaven. So we thought, you know, we must do something to draw people um, into this region. Uh, and we have eight rooms, eight suites that are in um, two bungalows. Uh, we started off with just four. And then um, when we realized that people were really appreciating what we had created in the original manager's bungalow, we decided to replicate that into a second bungalow. So now we have um, eight rooms. Uh, but if you look at Glenburn Tea Estate as an estate, um, you can see how in the 758 hectares, we actually have more protected forests than we have tea. And that's what really made um, Glenburn a really interesting uh, tourism project um, in many ways, because there was so much to protect within the forest, as well as so much to talk about when it came to the tea. Uh, and a tea estate is really like a mini kingdom. And we have three primary schools within the estate. We have uh, eight villages, we have temples, we have churches, we have Buddhist monasteries and, you know, the community that lived here were brought across um, into India from Nepal in the 19th century by the British planters that wanted to set up um, the tea estate. So they've been here for four or five generations and much of our work is also uh, preserving and celebrating their local traditions and their customs. Um, we also have two rivers that run through the estate. 
so it really is a beautiful collection of landscapes, um, of tea fields, of flowers, birds, butterflies. Um, so, you know, the journey to discover this has been very organic over 20 years. I never thought that I would be here uh, 20 years later. And our most recent uh, project has been to, to work at conserving the Golden Marcia, which uh, this, this black and white picture is actually from a family album from one of our managers uh, from the 1920s. And you can see the size of this fish. Um, and this one on the left was actually caught during the pandemic, catch and release, of course, it was put back into the river. Um, but before the pandemic, the size of the fish was absolutely tiny. And there were all these illegal fishing methods that were being used, things like bleaching powder and, and dynamite and electricity to kill the fish. So the, for the last few years, we've been trying to work on, on educating the locals to try and allow these beautiful fish to thrive um, to what they used to be. Um, and then the other aspect of what has happened so organically is the awareness of what goes into that cup of tea that you know, millions of people drink every day. There are about 15,000 cups of tea drunk every second. It's the most drunk beverage in the world after water. And Darjeeling tea actually comes from a very select part of the world. So just, just like champagne can only come from champagne, Darjeeling tea can only come from 87 tea estates up in the mountains, um, of, uh, up in the foothills of the Himalayas in Eastern India. And uh, so it's a very small amount of production, but it has a very high value. And what's happened over the years is that the cost of production has gone up, but the cost of tea hasn't really gone up. Um, so compared to our tea estate in Assam, where we make millions of kgs of tea that sells at a much lower price, in Glenburn, we make just a small amount of tea, but because it, it needs to sell it at quite a high price to, to sort of support the economic model of the tea estate, um, these estates are struggling. So a lot of them are now financially um, uh, sort of unviable. So what we've done over 20 years is actually brought a huge number of tourists into the estate and they have actually realized um, this human face that comes um, with that cup of tea that nobody really appreciates and there are a thousand workers and their families that live on the estate um, and you know their jobs are guaranteed for life and then are passed on to the next generation um, you know the, the um, estate provides housing, medical care, subsidized food rations, pension funds. Uh, these are all the incredible benefits that come within um, the tea estate and the family of tea workers that live within the estate, almost four to 5,000 workers, including all their families. Uh, so each cup of tea that people drink uh, actually represents these people. And that's something that um, very mindfully has now been transmitted to all the people that have visited Glenburn over the last 20 years. And um, Ranjan, for example, who works at the hotel, is the fourth generation from his family that have worked on the estate. And uh, since I took this picture, his, his great grandparents have actually passed away and now he has two children of his own. And it's just a wonderful legacy that's been passed down um, the generations. We also uh, promote a lot of women. Uh, of course, the, the bulk of the workers are actually women because they pick the tea, uh, but we're also promoting them to supervisory positions and also educating um, a lot of girls as part of an education program that we started uh, about 15 years ago. And we now provide um, extra teachers and enhance the facilities of the government run primary schools within the estates. But we've also added a kindergarten and, and a nursery section to these schools. We've provided, we pay salaries to extra teachers. Um, we've helped with classrooms, uh, with uniforms, and just the, the wonderful interaction that we have between the guests and the children uh, when, the, when the visitors come. Uh, we've had uh, reading libraries and holiday workshops, and our scholarship program supports 64 children in um, secondary schools, uh, private schools in the region. So this was our first batch of, of seven or eight kids, and this little girl in the middle, and this boy Ligan over there, Nikita, they're all now in their year 12, and in 2014, Nikita got sort of student of the year, and then two years ago, she was head girl, and this year she's due to finish school and she wants to become a doctor. So, you know, looking back to these kids that started with us when they were four and a half or five years old, it's just been a wonderful journey for many of them. Um, we also support music and dance and the local Nepali culture through um, a, an annual festival and um, a dance and music academy where we have teachers that come and um, teach anyone who's, who's interested. So this is, these are scenes from the annual festival and the, the girls dancing. So the boutique hotel has really um, uh, sort of brought this into the community, but in what we hope is a sustainable um, manner and, and a, 
uh, an organic manner that has promoted um, education um, and uh, skills and naturalist um, skills and hospitality skills to a group of people that would never really have been exposed to the kind of guests that we have from all around the world. And um, we have 55 staff members working in our eight room hotel, all from local villages. So from their um, sort of cooking skills, their driving skills, they're, they're all our guides and naturalists. Everything has been learned on the job. We don't have a single professionally trained member of staff. And it is really them who bring the experience uh, to each and every guest. And over the years, we've been um, featured in international magazines and more recently, even in India, um, we were awarded the best luxury hill resort in India. And this year, the most responsible hotel in India, which was our proudest award, of course, um, thanks to our work with the community. So we've come a long way from my first uh, trip to the World Travel Mart when I had four rooms and people used to laugh at me and say, really, is four rooms a hotel? Um, they couldn't quite understand how I, I could take a four room hotel seriously, but it's been a wonderful journey. Um, and I was just, just before the presentation, I was trying to do some maths with my daughter. I said, we have about 50 to 60% occupancy during the day and eight, uh, during the year and eight rooms. And we worked out that actually three and a half thousand visitors come to Glenburn every year, which means that over 19 to 20 years, 65,000 people have come to Glenburn. And even I hadn't processed that amount until I did the maths just sort of half an hour ago. And um, all these people now know exactly what goes into making that cup of Darjeeling tea and also will hopefully go back and tell their friends about the work that we're doing. So there was never a plan. It was just meeting the right people at the right time. People like Shoba, <laughs> who sort of helped me take uh, Glenburn where it is and, and learning from other people in the community like Joanna with the sustainable practices that all the members of the rare community practice and learn from each other. Um, and uh, it's been organic and it's been wonderful to make this journey. So if we brought mindful tourism into Eastern India. It's been something that we've done with the local community and it's all their credit, <laughs> credit due to them. Thank you. Thank you. Every time I see your presentation and there's something new to learn always, the 65,000, the number is mind boggling really. <laughs> yeah. So Husna, also, I mean, we'll, we'll start off with you um, on the, uh, the next uh, part of the, uh, the questions for the panel, uh, you know, obviously out of the 65,000, a large part would be, uh, you know, guests will be from UK, right? That's that's your that's your TG, if you can. Uh, it yeah. started off with the UK, but I have to say the last maybe eight to 10 years, we've had an equal amount from Australia, New Zealand, America, Europe, um, you know, the, the English have been, were definitely my source market to begin with, because of course I had a connection with England. I used to do a lot of my marketing over there. But since then, it's really spread to many different nationalities. I think um, South America is probably the only continent and possibly Africa where we don't have a huge number of guests from, but we've tried. Yeah, yeah. yeah brilliant. And so if you were to imp uh, measure impact for travelers, you know, coming, who've been coming, uh, do they do a lot of them you know, I mean, 65,000 is a big number. I'm still trying to process it too. Uh, as a, yeah, so as a part of uh, impact building, do they keep in touch? Do, do they continue to support an initiative? Uh, does, that, uh, that, uh, does that happen? Do you... yes, we have many repeat guests and we've had people who come back four or five times. Each time they'll come back for a longer period of time. Um, we've had people reach out to us during the pandemic, checking on the staff, checking on, you know, how things are, how, how we're managing. Um, and of course, the, the scholarship program, um, we actually had to slow it down last year because we had so many offers of sponsorship and, um, you know, it's, it's quite challenging to actually get foreign funds into India under a charity. And that's something that, that um, you know, we, we have to tie up with, um, you know, with other charities to try exactly. and do that. Um, so that was actually the only reason that stopped the momentum that was building up. Um, but then once we had those 64 kids in school, we were like, okay, this is, this has to continue. continue um, so we've, yeah. we've um, you know, taken a pledge to see all these kids through school. And now 
the you know one of the oldest children um she was actually sponsored to go to Loreto College in Darjeeling um Darjeeling, yeah. sponsor and then she's now studying at the International Hospitality Management School in Calcutta and she's wow. actually the daughter of one of our drivers at the hotel and she's in her second year and won an award for rookie chef of the year last year so Wonderful. you know now our challenge is now how to you know sustain um, you know, these, the careers for these children, because um, we really want them to use their education to, you know, to take it forward. And, and many years ago, um, when I started with this program, it was inspired by Pratham, which was a, a big NGO that worked on education. They were sending a training group into our region. And I met the, the, the team and I said, can you do the same for Glenburn? And they said, I'm sorry, but Glenburn's not on our list. So I said, okay, can I send my people to learn from you? You don't have to fund it, I'll fund it, but can they learn how to measure literacy on the estate, how to set up these reading libraries and take it forward? And the lady that introduced us actually wrote to the Darjeeling Planters Association and said, look what Glenburn's doing on their own accord. Why don't more tea estates do this? And many of the responses that came from them, I'm embarrassed to say, was we don't want to educate the workers because they'll run oh off and do other things. Yeah. And, you know, my, it didn't even come to mind. I didn't even think of that. You know, for me, yeah. it was like the more we can do, you know, the, 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 we will do. And, you know, so it's, it's been something that's been extremely impactful within our region. And, 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 and this is a, entirely your own initiative. I mean, there's obviously no help from the uh, government in, no. in, your, in any of this. Yeah. But, Great. but it's amazing how, it, like I said, it, it was so organic. Like I never had a master plan. I never okay. even wanted to become a hotelier. So it's amazing Thanks. how things happen if you just, if you know, if you put one pebble into the stream, the ripples start and then suddenly it becomes like a tidal wave. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. So. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Jamie, I mean, talk, uh, coming to you, I, I'm very uh, curious to know about uh, the impact and if people continue to uh, support you even after they are, I mean, have, they have stayed and gone. Of course, there is always the repeat guest, I mean, them coming back. Uh, do you see that they support your initiatives even if they are, uh, I mean, long distance? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, we do um, somehow manage to keep in touch also with a few of our guests, especially in our team with the environmental officers, the ones who really get to like talk to them and they add us up on Facebook. Even the staff get added up on Facebook and they just follow our Facebook pages also. And they keep the engagement. And we see that it's been really good so far, especially with the COVID pandemic. It's been very hard. But then we've been lucky enough to have had like three very recent, very generous donors also who were able to fund four new projects for us. And these projects were able to hire a lot of the um, locals that were that whose work got displaced. So right now we have efforts because of them, and it's still continuing. And we can see that it will be able to continue until like the end of the year. So the engagement is just really it great. Just, we have yeah we have guests who message us asking us like when can we fly um i'm excited uh, i already have a booking for this year but um, it's okay i still go next year so yeah fantastic yeah great uh great jamie uh, joanna with bhavan do we see the same uh do guests um involve themselves and uh, they are in touch with you once they are uh, they are back in their homes or in their countries uh, Joanna, you're muted. That that is something that happens, and I think you know it was um, what we were hoping would happen. But as Husna says, it it is actually quite difficult to get funds from abroad now, and it's just becoming even more difficult in the last couple of weeks. So that's you know we've we've had offers through COVID, but um, from foreign nationals, it's too difficult to Maybe, receive yeah. funds. Yeah. But no, everybody, you know, even, I mean, before we started um, in the further away area, we were working with our local school in Toria village. So um, a lot of people were donating and getting involved in that also. With the, with the no, Bowen project, right? With the Bowen project. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna, one of the things which is always, um, you know, I'm always motivated by is, uh, which is against everything I have learned uh, before I met Raghu and you is that Raghu always believed that Raghu and you always believe that the money has to be, you know, the, the community has to, uh, the, the money from tourism has to go to the community. I mean, as money, I mean, 
uh, while everybody would say giving them money would make them, you know, this and, you know, they might get lazy and things like that. But you and Raghu believe that they should be compensated in cash so that they can lead a better life, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm being quite a believer in direct payment, but there's actually, I mean, generally there is, you know, the idea of a basic minimum wage for all. <clears throat> actually, the research shows that you know, it isn't a problem. I mean, everybody says get lazy, spend it on drink. I mean, anywhere in the world yeah. I'm talking, not just specific to here. Um, but there's really no proof of that at all. And in fact, there's lots of evidence in the other direction. So um, that's certainly uh, an idea. But I think part of it is using tourism um, as a means to create more conservation areas. I mean, as a proper sort of conservation dry tourism driver, so that um, because in these areas, there is very little source of livelihood. It's mostly small farmers. And, you know, the more we suffer climate change, the more difficult their life becomes. And so part of the, their livelihood comes from the forest. I mean, either grazing livestock or using the products from that. Not a very large amount, but then, you know, their livelihood is pretty small. So one can easily find ways to compensate so that um, and increase their livelihood while reducing their dependence and use of the forest. So that can also benefit. Yeah, that is true. And of course, their their dependence on the forest also reduces quite a bit, right? Yeah, it, it's not a huge percent of their livelihood at the moment. So, it, you know, I don't think it's a very difficult to change that. Partly. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Anyway, the details, you know, one yes. not <laughs> interesting you. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, Anna, I was very um, impressed by this uh, gorilla friendly pledge, you know, um, because one of the things I always believe that the traveler has to go back transformed, you know, uh, he, he needs to get the whole idea of, um, and Joanna is with me and we constantly talk about tiger conservation. What, what is the gorilla friendly pledge? And, do, do a lot of people um, accept it? Do they wear it um, proudly? Yeah, thank you, Shobha. Um, I think for a long time as conservation organizations, we've been fixated, especially when you think about mountain gorillas, but it's, it's the same for any other species, tigers or, or sea turtles. You have to respect proximity and make sure that you're attentive to not causing any um, stress on the animal, behavior change, and really important for mountain gorillas because they're, they're genetically similar to us is disease transmission. So a lot of our messaging as conservation organizations has been really very rule focused, right? We need people to know the rules. Um, and so the Gorilla Friendly Pledge is trying to shift to really understanding better some of the principles behind doing tourism right, um, doing tourism right with, with mountain gorillas. And I think we, um, to where we, we really encourage, you know, self-learning and self-empowered um, decision-making as a consumer as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have over probably 20 years made posters of rules and this distributed rules and train people on how to articulate rules. And that, that's not really what responsible or mindful tourism is about. Yes, those are important, but, but it's really about cultivating, um, yeah, that sense of wonder that even if someone is really focused on that photo that they're going to get to take home, um, the opportunities for having something much more meaningful are there. And, and we get that great opportunity and privilege to help, you know, provide depth of experience um, through those. So, you know, when we first tested it, a lot of the reactions are that it actually made people uncomfortable because, you know, if, if they don't follow the rules exactly, they done something wrong. Um, so we're still, we're still modifying the language so that way it cultivates yeah, more of that pleasure in the experience. Um, so that's, 
Um, but but it, it, to a short question. <laughs> yeah, but but we're working, right? I mean, it is a lot of people do because he, as human beings, I think we are very bad at self-regulation. So I think these little messaging yeah. that you give out into where conservation is concerned, it only works. Um, it it kind of um, uh, it kind of uh, you know helps. Um, have a, a traveler traveler mindset. I mean, it helps change traveler mindset. It it helps change traveler behavior, right? From where they think that, uh, you know, looking at gorilla, you know, I, you see people whistling at it, calling out to, you know, wild animals. I mean, I, I was just recently somewhere and I was horrified that the guide himself was whistling at the, at the, uh, at a bear, you know. So uh, do you think that it has, you have, it has created impact in, uh, among the travelers? Um, not yet. And I think that's where the pledge in and of itself is yeah. only one part of the more comprehensive certified gorilla friendly approach. So us as a conservation organization and us as a civil society organization, yeah, we need the partners from the private sector. You know, we need yeah, yeah. Um, the government buy-in to really you know, elevate. So even the the outbound travel agents who, who handle the bookings for a lot of clients as that first, first um, uh, point of contact. Contact, um, yeah. Yeah, so there's still a lot of awareness. A lot of, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and getting people on board. And again, it's really exciting to hear about three, you know, private sector entities that are operating as, as businesses um, with some foundation work or other work um, associated with it. And, you know, those are the voices that when they start to be a critical mass, you reset the parameters for the That's really to your credit. So that's exciting. We're, we're yeah. inspired. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's really exciting, but, you know, more and more, I mean, I guess the messaging finally will reach the travel. I mean, there, there's a huge, um, in India, we've been, uh, there's a Responsible Tourism Society of India, and they've been working on a responsible traveler campaign where, you know, through videos and through, uh, through you know, gentle, direct and indirect messaging, we want every traveler, and an Indian traveler is, is still evolving, right? So, it's 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 a big challenge whether they go into the uh, whether they go into the national park or they're going to a beach or something littering and things like that are you know are are a big thing but uh, i think very uh, gentle messaging which can be reinforced like you rightly said from the tour operator to the hotelier to the guide and finally you know we're, and also if the government puts in the uh, the regulations and puts it out as regulations i think eventually the, tra the tour operator i mean the uh, travelers do get it and we can have better and better travelers tra you know going to these places uh, i think we're running out of time and uh, so one of the la one of the last questions i have for you and which is very important i don't know anna we can begin uh, with you if you are uh, if uh, because you're a uh, you're not a I don't think you're a commercial entity, but uh, in your uh, promotion of, uh, there must be a pro promotion for, for gorilla tourism. Do you put these, um, all these, um, um, you know, you know, the regulations or the uh, uh, wildlife friendly, the regulations that you have for gorilla tourism, do you put this out, uh, you know, forward, you put this out up front for when tourists are coming uh, to, to, to these uh, places to see the gorillas, do you put it out front or is it a gentle messaging on the side? I mean, you know, because you don't want to scare them off or they might probably start looking to other places to go to or, and is it the same in all these three places that, uh, you know, Rwanda, Uganda, and also Congo is? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, collaboration and actually there's an intergovernmental body that has been established to facilitate uh, collaboration and tourism development. So there's an understanding that, you know, everyone has to be, understanding and abiding by best practices for um, this, these two small populations to continue to exist because they're right along the, the international boundaries. Um, I think the, the messaging um, from the government agencies is quite forward facing about rules and regulations. And from the private sector, you know, it's there um, and, and, and it's varied. 
among the different actors. Um, I think one of the most critically important things that we ask is that the best thing you can do to get the messages across is not put up inappropriate photos and images or have those on your website or you know, share those on social media, even if it's not yours, even sharing it sets the wrong tone and expectation. So from our point of view, one of the biggest ways we can, we can protect what is the core of a successful mountain gorilla tourism product is making sure all the images represent um, those principles. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Joanna, Husna, and Jamie, y'all are um, hospitality products, right? At the end of the day, that's what you need to be. You need to sell rooms, right? For and it's it's the I won't say it's the backbone of your uh, your conservation story, but it does uh, contribute uh, to you know to the conservation or whatever you've set out to do in the areas. So, do you put out your your conservation uh, ideals and you, do you put out your conservation practices and what you do as a you know great strategy for marketing and i know joanna and i have spoken about this before that it you don't want it to to look like a commodity but uh, me i i'm a marketing by a person myself and for me to always distinguish uh, the rare group of hotels from everyone else the conservation story is actually a big thing right so how, Joanna, we can begin with you. How do you think the conservation story has to be put out so that it doesn't become a commodity through which we are uh, promoting your property, but it's a genuine, um, you know, call out to people and travelers to travel to an area like this so that the, the destination and the community can be impacted positively? That's a very good question, Shobha, and I, um, I'm not sure that I know how to answer it because I think we've, We've always been quite wary about putting it forward as a marketing tool because I think that um, you know all these terms sustainable, mindful, regenerative, conservation tourism, you know they've they're sort of whipped up by the market and they become they have a whole you know another entity which doesn't necessarily reflect what we think about them. So I guess in a sense we don't actually use that too much, although it is reflected in our um, website to some extent and social media certainly in that we um, you know include things that we're doing through Bowen on our Soraya social media but I think um, you know things will change like Anna was saying that the more that people and I mean the actual travelers and the also the agents that bring them to us um, respect and support mindful tourism um, responsible tourism I think the more the businesses will then see it as a business advantage also. So, you know, even if they don't come from a sort of conservation mentality, it will become um, something that they will want to do to keep their businesses up there with everybody else. So it is, you know, I think it is something we do have to talk about. Have to, yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the theme of this talk as well, about how ecology and economy are interlinked and how they can work in tandem with each other. And Jamie, what do you think? I mean, do you, how do you, uh, I, you all are younger, you know, you, like you said, you're the youngest uh, on the panelist and I'm sure you must be having a few tricks that you, that puts all these ideas out yet does not, you know, doesn't make it look like a commodity. Um, it may seem that way, but it's actually really very difficult to strike a balance between, you know, just wanting to promote and get people on board in becoming responsible and sustainable tourists. But then um, if you will actually look at our social media pages, we have, and our website, we have separate ones. Like we have one for the hotel, Alida Resorts. We also have one for the estate, Leo Beach. And then we have one for the sustainability, the environment side, which is ours, Be Green. So yeah. we tried to also compartmentalize. And at first it was because it, um, it has just been challenging to merge it somehow. Um, without really, like, well, as you said, seeming seeming like it's like, okay, you have to be this way when you come here and we are going to be very strict with you. So we have to balance that with, okay, we're here, we'll help you and all of that. So um, the thing about El Nido, and I think with most of the places that, well, your places as well, um, it's very beautiful and it's very easy to attract people. So what we do is we 
actually put in a lot more efforts um, when they get here, once the guests get here. And we have two ways in which we do that. Uh, we have the hotels that are operating, and then we also have the estate that operates, and we have other businesses within the estate. So for the hotels, um, as mentioned a while ago, we have a lot of engagement with them. And then even if a lot of people say that the customer is always right, we say that if it's about conservation, then we are right because we are backed by science. And yeah. if you say that fish should be fed with bread, then we will say no, definitely not. And we will stop you <laughs> from doing it. So there's things like that. You have to be soft in some areas, but then also hard in some some ways. And then for the estate side, for the estate development, since we work with a lot of um, other businesses, other entities, especially other developers who are not very familiar with um, how things are done or should be done sustainably, we try our best to be strict with them in terms of policies. And then we conduct a lot of site visits and audits. And I think for us, it's okay that we're that way because it's the only way that we can really get people to switch into a different mindset. I mean, we have climate change. We have so many things happening right now to us and we cannot afford to like slow down and be uh, to, like be very careful and very, um, I, I don't know, afraid of um, getting people in line because time is really off the essence and what we're facing is really urgent and we need to do everything we can to like just get in line. Yeah, very can, right. can I, may I just agree with Jamie about the consumer in, with tourism, the consumer is not always right. I think it's <laughs> one area. Um, and in fact, that sort of quite strongly, I think should be because we have to lead them to appreciate what it's responsible to provide rather than provide what they think they want. And I think they will, they come round to that. You know, yeah. I mean, like the plastic bottle, everybody told us when we started the hotel, you know, but guests will demand plastic bottles. You can't run a hotel without water bottles, um, bisleri bottles and all. And, but we said, no, we're not going to. And, you know, actually it's not been a problem at all. And now most people don't expect to get plastic bottles um, yeah. and that can go into many spheres so yes no the consumer is not always right not always right <laughs> yes absolutely jamie husna um thank you yes um yes i ag agree with all those those sentiments and it's it's interesting for us because um you see at the end of the day we are at tea estate and a lot of the the community um sort of stories also link back to the retail model of our selling tea and People are very concerned about the mistreatment or the bad treatment of workers on tea estates and the fact that they don't live in good housing and that, you know, the profits just go to the company and, and you know, you should be certified by fair trade. And, you know, we can't um, afford to be certified by fair trade because it costs so much money to be certified by fair trade. So mm. for 20 years, I've always said that you come visit and certify us yourselves. If you come mm. and see what we're doing, then you will automatically want to buy our tea because you can see how happy the people are, how you know how they are actually living in, in, in decent homes. During mm -hmm. COVID, when so many migrant workers in India had were homeless and traveling across the country, the workers on tea estates never changed their way of life. They still received their subsidized rations. Nothing happened to their, their home they were they were still paid you know the, the estate shut down for I think four weeks and then they were open again so they have not been affected touch wood at all by the pandemic and their lives have continued exactly as they were so you know my, my philosophy has always been that come and see for yourself see what we're doing um, interact with the community and then you will want to buy our tea because it is it is fair trade in the truest sense of the word and we are certified by the rainforest alliance which we found was a very um, interesting organization because it supported both the environment and the community and we got 100 percent in our community relations and our wildlife protection so that was that was really nice and also leading by example and teaching people through practices is something that i didn't really um, understand the impact of until I, I heard it being talked about at um, one of the travel shows that I was attending at the seminar and um, the speaker was talking about how, for example, if you have a bamboo toothbrush in a bathroom and a family discovers a bamboo toothbrush for the first time, the children may have never seen a bamboo toothbrush. They, they, they may never have even known that they exist and they're, they're only used to plastic toothbrushes. And then while our team 
to them the value of using a bamboo toothbrush and the, the terrible things that happen to plastic toothbrushes. That's an education in itself. And those children will go home and they will tell their parents, can we now brush our teeth with bamboo toothbrushes? And that little example really um, sort of, sort of made me realize how just leading by example is a form of education for the uninformed tourist. And it's the same with the plastic water bottles. When we got the confidence to actually invest in our own, so that we don't have a huge water treatment plant, but we have you know, RO water that we offer to our guests, 90% of them accepted it very happily. And recently we had an Indian family that came and I got a call from my manager saying that, you know, they want us to use bottled water even for the tea that is going to be boiled in kettles, which is already sterilizing it. And we had actually, we have an all-inclusive package at Glenburn where everything is included. Um, you don't have to ask, you don't pay for anything. It's all part of the full board package. But a couple of years ago, we started charging for packaged mineral water just a nominal fee as an example to say that it's not that we can't include it but we want you to realize the cost of us using a plastic bottle um, and the impact it has on the environment so my manager called me up and said you know what should I do because you know we've just spent two and a half liters on them just boiling mineral water for tea and I said that's fine just charge them for it and in doing so let them realize that you know that little bit of extra that they have to pay for it's not very much but it's a lesson in sustainability and how they don't really have to do that so so i think by example we can yeah and 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 you know tourism teaches in that way you know and you can learn from good practices in tourism and to me that really impacted me just hearing that speaker talk about how you know not changing sheets every day reusing you know um, can actually educate the traveler and then they take that home and then use those principles in their daily lives and i think yeah. to me that is a great message and a great that's a great message and a, and a, and a big part of um, uh, transformation uh, where you talk about my when you talk about mindful travel or regenerative travel i think well thank you ladies it's it was wonderful chatting with all of you and i'm sure that we can we will be there's so much to talk about we need another session but um i'm you know quite intrigued because when i started off i said there are two people talking about community and there'll be two people talking about biodiversity and nature and as you can see both uh, when they were talking about biodiversity nature and conservation they had to they, they were they were there was people, there were people in it, right? And when you all, you all were talking about uh, communities, there were, there were nature and biodiversity in it. So I guess these two are intrinsically linked with each other. And uh, I hope uh, all our endeavors, and uh, for me as a marketing person, I love taking your stories and telling, to pe telling them to people. And like Husna, you rightly pointed out, um, this also places like yours, um, anywhere in the world, these are also places for small transformations not only while they're traveling, but also in their lifestyle choices that they make. Great, thanks so much. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to add something. Oh, go like, ahead, it doesn't go have ahead. to be, it doesn't have to be part of the video or anything, no, but no, jumping yeah. off from what Joanna said a while ago and what Krishna said about the staff being compensated and being trained, we also had that similar problem and, you know, there is a percentage that will be lazy when they get paid, that will leave when they get trained, but it's okay because there's always also the other side, the percentage and the bigger percentage of people who will actually do something with what they get and transform themselves, transform their lives and transform other people. So we've seen that happen here. We have a lot of staff who started with us a long time ago and then they stayed with, with us also for a long time. And then all of a sudden now they have their own businesses. So it's great yeah. to see them that way. And then when they have their own businesses, they carry with them the practices that they learned from us. Absolutely. So it's very touching to see especially when um, our management teams, it's usually the management teams anyway that tend to like leave and then move on to bigger opportunities. And we saw how they also took everything that they learned from here and tried to apply it into their new um, companies who have never done anything like that before. So even something as simple as bringing coastal cleanups to another area is already a big thing. And really nothing should stop us from compensating people well and training them. Brilliant. Jamie, you are a young heart with an old soul. <laughs> so wonderful. I mean, yeah, that is absolutely right. I mean, and that's a lesson for all of us. When people leave and go, they take a bit of 
you know, the bit of what they have learned with them. Yes, I completely agree with you. And many of them come back. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, come actually, back. our big disappointment is that very few of them have gone, have gone. <laughs> we trained them and they'd move on, but they've all been with us for 10 years. <laughs> They're just so happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, thanks, sorry, thanks, thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I think I think it's been great, and I think I've probably I've learned a lot myself yeah, just by listening here. to all of you over the last hour and a half. All of us. And and the reason the reason why we actually decided to have this webinar at this point in time as a part of the Latinomics Forum really is that I think we've all realized now that we all live and work in places with very unique biocultural diversities. And the fact that we have these unique bicultural diversities is because we have not really been industrialized. Because I think, I think we have also learned that heavy or uh, common industrialization cannot coexist with biocultural diversities and, and allow biocultural diversities to thrive. So the one reason why, why we wanted to get all of you together is to try and connect our sort of entities that kind of work in silos. I think Shobha has has you know, done a great job in sort of bringing many of these entities together in the Indian subcontinent and our neighbors. But I think it is really time that we get together and sort of create a larger movement. So this, this webinar, I hope, is the first in a series of creating a larger movement and a larger movement, not just in India, but across Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and actually across the world. So we will actually be, be taking notes from this to start creating policy re recommendations for, for the Indian government, for the government of the various states in India, and then working together with our partners in the Eastern Himalayan zone to come up with a policy recommendation for what a future mindful tourism could look like. Could look and like. I think that and I think that COVID has changed a lot of things for the better, for the worse. And but I think that now is really the time when we must connect all of our actions irrespective of where we are in the world and try and create not only a, a movement to convince our respective governments, but actually to create a good global movement to influence many others. You know, I, and I think that we are sort of like the selected few that are that understand and are practicing sustainability. But we owe it to people who are younger. In fact, younger to me as well, younger to all of us, to actually get more and more people on board. You know, on this on this movement. So, thank you so very much.